Stephen Blush, and welcome to The Leaf, your home for heavy cannabis culture. Each episode, we present views, reviews, and interviews involving your favorite subject. We speak with the greats of cannabis culture, be they artistic, musical, medical, political, scientific, recreational, or ethical. Now, before we get started, I'm going to reach into my back pocket and pull out a pack of bamboo. And let me introduce my man, your man, the man, Tony Man. Welcome, Tony. Thank you, Stephen. We got a really great episode for you. We're going to Zoom with Ernie Shepalu, the creator of Cheech and Chong's Big Bamboo and so much more. You mean Pacific Eye and Ear, who designed the coolest album covers you'd ever want to hear? Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath, the Rolling Stones original Lips and Tongue logo, Aerosmith Toys in the Attic and Rocks, Billion Dollar Babies for Alice Cooper, Schools Out, E Pluribus Funk for Grand Funk. Wow, you sold me. Okay, let's do it, but I'll keep it brief. Welcome, Ernie Sheffaloo, to The Leaf. Thank you, How Steve. You doing? Thank you, Tony. It's Welcome. an honor to be here. And, and, and thank you so much for even considering letting me be on your show. I'm oh, truly terrific. honored. I really am. I love thank Tony. You. I love you guys. You know, I mean, I love music and I love drugs. So there you go. Mainly pop. <laughs> right on. Yeah, I'm full of love tonight. Talk so. about coming of age, you know, going to school, learning about design and packaging, co-mixing with the rock scene as that's developing and what's going on in your head and all the possibilities. Yeah, it was a it was an interesting career because I never really knew, you know, I grew up in the late 50s and early 60s in co- a junior high school and high school and my where I grew up in San Jose was a lot like American graffiti. It was all about your car and you know dragging the main and and just socializing that way and maybe some sock hop dances or something and there was a club for young kids from uh, 13 to four to 16 before they could start driving, it was called the What's It. And you'd go there and it was, you know, it was a Catholic organization and they played rock music and stuff. And so that was mainly the scene. And, you know, I never really thought about going to college. I was always busy. I had a 57 Chevy and I'm dragging the main and hanging with my buddies. But then after high school, they all had jobs and I didn't really, I didn't really have any kind of skill. I mean, I like to draw and stuff, but that was never, I never really considered it as a, as a vocation. And then <clears throat> I decided, you know, they're all working. I didn't really have any kind of skill. So I decided to go in the army. And so I joined a, a reserve unit right before, like in 1963, right out of high school. And what that did was it really, that six months really uh, woke me up into to realizing that I needed to do something with my life. And um, the easiest thing for me to do would be artwork, even though I never imagined I could make a career out of it. Um, art school was seemed like to be the only thing that I was really good at. And just like in junior high school, you start out and you're in an art class and you become the best in the class. Then you go to high school and there's a lot more competition. There's more artists that are going there. So you have to, over the years, become the best one at that. And then you go to college and it's really crazy because it's just that. And it's just all these good people doing all these amazing work and you start all over again, you know? And, and my career has kind of been like that. I mean, I, I went to art school I, and I luckily I went to a, a college that offered a lot of variety. They had jewelry, they had fine arts, they had advertising. Advertising and, and stuff, design was at the bottom of the rung because it was more of a, an art school you know, a fine art school and, and advertising people were like, they were like hookers, you know, they'd sell their (laughs) art for money and they'd compromise it. So, um, you know, I was, but, but I had a lot of really good friends and exposure to all the other pieces of art and, and, and different studies. And so one semester I wanted to be a sculptor, then I decided I want to be a painter. Then I decided I wanted to be a jeweler. And I, and so you start changing your major And I got into my junior year and it's like, man, I got to, I can't make money at any of this stuff. What can I make money at? (laughs) And what have I been really excelling in, in my classes, you know, over the years? And it was design. And I had a really, uh, really good design teacher who really encouraged me. And, 
And I was really lucky. And, and so I decided that I was going to go to New York and be an ad guy. I had never really been to New York, never really been out of California, never really been out of San Jose, really. But um, decided that if I was going to do something, and by that time, I was like the best, you know, in my college in, in, in advertising. So and, and, and graphics. And so I decided if I was really going to do something and make a difference, I'd go to New York because that's where you had to go. That's where the opportunity was. And even in college, I was freelancing at different ad agencies in San Francisco and in Oakland, but it was, it was really no opportunity, nothing big, you know, and I th figured, you know, go big or go home. So I decided that I would go to New York and I packed up a portfolio. I spent a whole semester just putting together a portfolio that I could go to New York with. And I was certain that I would be able to bring it to its knees and get what I wanted because I was great. And I go there and it was just like starting all over again. There's all these amazing <laughs> designers and illustrators and all this opportunity. And it was overwhelming. And for a couple of weeks, I tried and tried and tried to get a job. And I just wasn't, wasn't firing on all six cylinder, all eight cylinders. So uh, my my girlfriend at the time, we had been together for six years and she stayed in Oakland in our apartment until I got the job in a couple of weeks and, you know, sent for her and she was going to come out and we were going to live happily ever after in New York. And I remember I just, uh, after that, toward the end of that second week, I was just totally, you know, uh, I, I overestimated everything. I had no idea of how brutal the the real world was and New York was the real world. And so I called her up. I remember it was like on a Thursday night and I had one more appointment the following week, but I was just done. I, you know, I was through. And so I called her up and I said, you know, uh, basically I'm, I'm, you know, I, I misjudged it. I, I, I really, uh, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I've decided to come back home and I can work there in the Bay area and we'll be near our families, both in San Jose and we're in Oakland. So that would be good. And we had been together for six years and she said to me, um, well, you know, you can go ahead and come on back, but I'm not going to be here when you come back. And I said, what do you mean? What are you talking about? And she said, I, I'm, I don't want to spend the rest of my life with somebody that's going to run from adversity, you know, because it becomes a habit. And then pretty soon you're running from everything. And I don't want to spend my life with somebody like that. I couldn't believe it. I mean, it just, I hung up the phone and I just couldn't believe it. And I actually called her back to make sure that she meant what she said. <laughs> and she did. Wow. And so... I decided that I would give it another shot in that one job interview that I had left was um, I got the job and it was to design a national sales meeting for international paper, all their salespeople, about, about 450 of them from all over the United States came to New York for a national sales meeting. So <clears throat> it was, uh, so they hired me to do that. And I, I did it. I, I created a off-Broadway kind of rockettes kind of thing with skits and dancers. And we hired a couple of songwriters to write songs about paper and stuff. And then we pressed an album, a record with the 10 songs. And I designed this octagon album cover. And the, the promotion was called Dolls Alive. And you came and you experienced this show. It was a three-day uh, event. And I had the first better part of the first day to do this whole getting everybody um, pumped up and ready to go and taking care of business afterwards. This was the entertainment piece of it. So as a, and there were teasers and there was a poster. And like I said, we, we, we pressed an album and um, on the label of the album, I put a pair of lips. And <clears throat> so that was in 1969. So I liked that album thing and the and the show was a huge success and we gave everybody that attended an album as a takeaway with all the songs and stuff that they heard during the that presentation and um and that it ended up winning all these awards and it hung in the union carbide building uh in new york uh for six months and there was a headhunter that worked in that building and i get this call one day from him saying there's this agency that he wants to send me to on madison avenue that needs somebody that does album covers. And I had only done one and it wasn't really an album cover. It was a, <laughs> you know, a, a gift, a, you know, it was a swag. And uh, so I, you know, he was a good talker and I talked me into going and I went on this interview and it was uh, a very straight agency in the New York Life Building on the 37th floor facing uptown. 
and the whole they had the whole half a building it was all glass it looked out over the city it was like being on a birthday cake with all the <laughs> lights lit up i mean it was amazing and and so they they but it was scary because it was a real ad agency like there was a guy every the guy who owned the agency uh, was a master sergeant retired marine corps so he ran that agency like you were in the Marine Corps. There was two guys that came in in the morning and they would string a line from one end of the studio to the other and line up all the water bowls, all the brushes, all the pencil sharpeners, all the, you know, and it had to be like that. And then there was a guy and there, there was probably 20 people that worked there doing all the production. And there was a separate room with a couple of illustrators and I was a graphic designer. And it scared me because when I was there, for the interview, I had to wait an hour, hour and a half because the boss wasn't there. And I'm watching this thing come to life. And there was a guy who was the head of production and he, his job was to make sure that the work flowed quickly through the different departments. And he, his job was to smoke six packs of cigarettes a day, drink three pots of coffee and have two heart attacks before the end of every day. And so I'm thinking to myself, man, there's no way, no way. And I didn't know what album cover or anything. I just knew they needed somebody. And I brought my Dolls Alive album cover. And so I'm thinking there's just no way. I'm happy where I am. Um, I don't really want to work in this kind of an environment because everybody was straight, man. And I had, I looked, I looked like I worked on a railroad. I had a big full beard. And I was wearing overalls and a Fakino hat. And, you know, that was <laughs> the look. And, and uh, this guy comes, he finally comes, and, and I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I don't want to work here, I don't want to work here. And he's looking at my work, and he's looking at the album, and, and uh, he, he, he looked like a master sergeant from the Marine Corps. He shaved head, put his glasses up on his forehead, and he leaned back in his chair, and he goes, uh, I like your work, you know, how much are you looking for? So I just spewed out 30,000 more than I was getting where I was working, because I was sure that that would be the thing that would clinch the deal uh, against me working there. And it, it did. He just said, you know, uh, it's a bit more than we were wanting to spend. We like your work, but I don't think that we can do that. And I was uh, very regretfully, I said, well, thank you very much for giving me the time. And I was so elated that I took a cab home from to Brooklyn instead of taking the <laughs> F train. I took a cab and I was just so happy. And then as I got into Brooklyn, we lived in, in Park Slope. And, uh, and I was, I, I dawned on me that I'm going to have to come up with some reason to tell my wife why I didn't get the job. And I can't tell her that I offered, I, you know, blurted out a price that I knew they wouldn't pay. So I wouldn't get it because she was into me, you know, it's Madison Avenue. It's the big agencies. And so I'm thinking of what I'm going to do, what kind of, and it, she's already talked to the headhunter. The headhunters gotten to her and primed her to get me to move because I was like, I'm the kind of guy that gets a job, I'll stay there. I don't wanna be the guy that, you know, is just, this job is just right now and it's not the right one, I'll end up somewhere. You can't do that, people see that and I wasn't like that. And, but, but this guy was very aggressive. And, and, uh, and so by the time I got to the front door, she was right there. And before I could say anything, she said, Mr. Levitt called you and he wants you to call him. And Levitt was the guy that owned the agency. So I call him up and he said, well, you know, I talked to my partner and, you know, we've decided to go ahead and hire you. And I'm like, <laughs> I, uh, you know, uh, we decided we're going to go ahead and hire you. And if you could come in on Saturday, I'll give you a brief of what's going on. So I went in on Saturday and he gave me the lowdown how there were these two art directors that worked at his agency on the DECA Records account. Okay, and they had done some album covers with uh, the creative director there, Bill Levy, and uh, they were leaving the agency and taking that account with them to start their agency with. And that happens a lot in the advertising business. I mean, that's why, you know, there's account executives. Account executives get between the client and the, and the person that's doing the work. So there's no way that the client can get to the guy that's doing the work. It's like blow. Remember Blow when yeah. they kept pressing Johnny Depp for his connection, Pee Wee yeah. Herman, and he wouldn't do it, wouldn't do it. And as soon as he did it, man, what they do, they cut him out and went, and that's what happens. You know, they've cut mm -hmm. you out. So they keep the creative away from the client and they're the in-between guy who relays back and forth, which is bullshit. But, um, and that's a whole nother story. But, um, and so, uh, you know, it, I go in on a Saturday, he starts telling me this 
about these two art directors that have befriended this creative director and they're leaving the agency, they're taking the account with them. But what he had done was he knew a, a, a vice president there that was above this creative director. And so he got that guy to get the creative director to agree to a shootout between his agency and these two guys that had left. And, um, and so, you know, I didn't, we didn't know what the project was. So I, you know, I'm hired. I, he briefed me, we had lunch. I went back home and on Monday morning, we went to Decca records and met with Bill Levy. And, you know, he was really, you could tell he was for the other guys, you know, you can just feel it. And, um, and so, you know, he starts telling us about this project and it, it's the Jesus Christ superstar album. And it's, it's <laughs> wow. these, two, these two unknown guys from England, <laughs> Tim Rice and Andrew Lloyd Webber. And that was, it was a three album set. They cut it down to two. It was three. Uh, and so the project was to do a cover and a package for the Jesus Christ Superstar album. And so he's filling us in on that. And then he said, uh, when would you like to pre present? And I didn't even give my boss a chance to say anything. I said, when are the other guys? They had already been briefed a week earlier, these other two guys. So they were already a week ahead. And so when he said, when do you want to uh, present? I said, well, today's Monday. How about Friday? And my boss, I could see my boss. He was, he made a fist. I think, you know, if we weren't <laughs> in front of the client, he'd probably punch me because that would have really should have been his decision to make. But I, I, I'm always of the belief that if I can get in there first and I can get them to fall in love with what I sell them or what I do for them, that the other company is going to have a really hard time trying to top it, you know? And so, uh, and I've been really good at that. I've been, I've, that's worked for me throughout my career and and you set the bar high and now they have to match it and uh and so in the cab on the way back i got a real tongue lashing from my boss <laughs> and <clears throat> i did a lot of praying and going around to different churches there in new york and just <laughs> welcome to mad men ernie bur yeah burning candles and stuff <laughs> like that you know uh doing a little pilgrimage uh, and so on Friday, I showed him three ideas, one of which were those angels. He fell in love with it. The other wow. guys came in on that Monday. They had, a, they had a really weird presentation. They didn't think it should say Jesus Christ Superstar. They thought it should be something else because that would offend too many people. And they had this, this drawing of it looked like Moses with this big beard and shit in it. You know, it was just not what it Terrible. needed. So so early, in our I'm, I'm kind of interested in this whole kind of concept of like, the really kind of like mafia conservative music business and these like really elaborate packaging. Like right. on one hand, these people were shysters, but on the other hand, they did spend for the art, you know? Yeah, but it was, it was something they did reluctantly and they right. had made a mistake. The, the biggest mistake they made was giving the artist complete control. <laughs> the, the musician <laughs> artist, okay? Uh, and that was done because they were, it was like a frenzy to sign bands. For some reason, the 60s and, and that whole hippie thing and, and into the 70s, there was a, a rush to get out there and sign anybody and everybody and just do these record deals. And, and they kept giving stuff up, you know? And one of the things they gave up was creative control, where the album could be produced, who would produce it, where the album would be designed, who would design it, where the album cover would be printed, because the guy that I worked for, that's what he did. He sold, because at the time, at that time, record companies weren't buying production album covers from printers. They were using brokers. And the guy that I went to work for was a broker. He grew up with Marshall Chess in Chicago. They were yeah. best friends. He came to New York to, uh, he sold stickers. He was a sticker guy. Uh, if you remember the uh, Velvet Underground, the white album with the banana peel, he did that sticker. You could pull it off and put it on and pull it off and put it on. And he did all these stickers, like if it was a Jackson Brown album and it, it had a sticker on it that said, Doctor My Eyes, th this album contains a hit single. So that's what he did. But the other thing that he did was, and, and, and that's another thing that was happening. Not only was the music scene moving from the East Coast to the West Coast, because the sound was coming from there, album packaging itself was evolving. It was going from a, a chipboard sleeve it was wrapped with two pieces of paper or in a, a gatefold. It was front and back wrapped over with a back inside pasted on it 
to printing directly on board. Because when you print directly on board, you have better control with die cuts and embossing and you can do crazy things like the big bamboo cover. You couldn't do that with a paper mounted board, um, a paper mounted album cover. It had to be printed directly on board. So the guy that I was working for, he would buy the album from the printer and sell it to the record company. When we did the sticky finger package, he bought that from the printer and sold it to Atlantic Records. And he made a wow. nice nice return on investment right there. That margin was sweet. And I'm the sure. first initial order was a million and a half albums. Yeah, you know, the, the whole idea of like these, um, the old school music business versus this hippie thing, you know, your art really spoke to that, so. Yeah, uh, yeah. absolutely. We, well, and I, also you're coming from the thing of like the, the uh, mechanical, creation of the package and packaging design but also you have the art knowledge so you're marrying the two and this is when this starts to happen when the whole music business is skyrocketing and we didn't have the internet or other right. ways to really advertise it so that was the advertisement right yeah. there that was the calling card what you were creating is why people f pulled it off the shelf instead of buying a sandwich or whatever yeah, well, you know, you're right, Tony, because the only real place that you would find out what was going on was either Circus Magazine, Crawdaddy, you know, yep. uh, Rolling Stone Magazine, and the disc jockeys. The yep. disc jockeys were key. And our job, I always looked at it to exactly what you said. My job was to be the link between the musician and his music and the fan. I created that emotional connection with what I created. And, and that was really job number one for me. And, and you know, I remember, you know, the first time uh, when, when we came here uh, to open up a satellite office from New York, I came with the guy that we worked for, his vice president and myself. And our job was to set up a satellite office in Los Angeles. All this work was promised by him. He was a real hustler. And, you know, he was in at A&M Records with Gil Friesen and those guys. And we were going to get all this work and none of that ever materialized. So we're out here, his vice president that had never been to California. I'm in California, but I grew up in Northern California. never really did anything but visit Southern California. And we knew nobody. But luckily, <laughs> I, used to read, I used to read from cover to cover Billboard magazine. And there was an article, there was a section in Billboard magazine called Bubbling Under. And Bubbling Under was who's in the studio, who's on tour, who's doing the new single and all that stuff. And I found out that two of the groups that I was really and heavily loving was Alice Cooper was in the studio doing a new album called Schools Out. And Cheech and Chong were in the studio doing a new album, No Name. So I decided that if we could get out to Los Angeles and I knew that, you know, Alive Entertainment was Alice's company. They were right on Melrose, um, uh, a and Records, Ode Records was on the a and lot and that was the Charlie Chaplin lot there on La Brea and Sunset. If I could get out here, I could somehow get to, because we already had kind of supposedly this connection at A&M and at A&M, we just walked across the hall and there's Ode Records with Lou Adler and stuff. So I did two comps. I created the big bamboo package and I did it as a comp. I still have the sketches and all that stuff. And with the big cigarette. And it paper. wasn't called Big Bamboo until you came up. No, with no, it. they didn't have they didn't have a name for the album. That's I right. called it Big Bamboo because I thought That's it should right. be a pack of cigarette papers. And so right. I called it. There wasn't even a Big Bamboo cigarette paper. It was just bamboo. So right. they cut a deal and, and actually came out with Big Bamboo cigarette papers. You know, in fact, I, I talked to the woman who actually. Her grandparents gave her the company. She's running the company now, Bamboo Cigarette Papers. Wow. But, uh, that's another story. But anyway, um, so I had put these two comps together. The other one was uh, schools out. It was a school desk that the legs popped down underneath it. And these things latched over. And it was a little school desk that you'd lift up. And, this, and it was Shep Gordon's idea to put the record in the pair of panties. I had it in a regular sleeve. But when we showed him the comp, he cracked up and he said, no, no, this, he took the sleeve off and he had these paper panties. They ordered like, I don't know, half a million of them to drop over the Hollywood Bowl when Alice was appearing there at the Hollywood Bowl. They were going to, and I think they actually did drop the panties over the Hollywood Bowl. They, so, did, they, uh, they did. And they, they also did that because they somehow wanted to get the record banned by being 
a fire yeah. hazard because the panties yeah. were flammable or something. Yeah, they, it was actually locked up at the docks. They right. wouldn't clear it through customs and stuff. And Shep had to fight that. But Shep is beautiful. He has a way of taking the negative and turning it into a positive. He always told this story about when he went to see Alice Cooper live to talk to them about managing. He was at this theater and there were a couple hundred people there and Alice came out and 199 people got up and walked out when they mm-hmm. started playing. And he just sat there and he, and he thought to himself, any band that can communicate strongly, that strongly, so you just need to change the messaging, you know, and that was, you know, what he did. And I mean, and he was incredible, you know, what, what, with all that, but they invited us. So we, the guy I was out here with who became my partner, picked up the phone and he got Lou Adler on the phone and told him, you know, we're out here from New York and we've got the guy that did the Rolling Stones tongue and Jesus Christ Superstar, all this stuff. And he has an idea for you that we'd love to share with you. No obligation. If you don't like it, you know, just give us 15 minutes of your time. And he basically told the same story to Shep Gordon and Shep said, well, have you guys ever seen Alice live? No. Well, he's at the Palladium on Saturday night. Why don't you guys come? And we'll put your name at the door and, you know, we'll you get a chance to see him perform. So we were there. And to your point, Tony, there was no Internet. There was it was a very viral world. And and you really word of mouth. Word, yeah, of mouth. Yeah, word of mouth and disc jockeys. Disc jockeys were played a part of it because they'd get our album covers and talk about them on the on the air, which was a, a great for us. I mean, we really loved hearing that stuff. But but I remember that concert when Alice, they were, they were playing and Can Heat opened for them and the, the place was packed, the Palladium was packed. And uh, they started playing and they got most of the way through their set and they started doing this, the West Side Story song, the Sharks and the Jets. Oh yeah, Gutter Cat versus the Jets. Right, and, and they, they, the way Shep promoted the concert was in newspapers and stuff, if you had a weak heart, you shouldn't come to this concert. And they were, they had a staff of nurses and doctors on site for those that were faint of heart. So right. of course, it's like telling a kid, you can't do something. He's going to show up with his buddies. And that's what it was packed. So he came out, he's most of the way through his set. They start doing that West Side Story song and there's a heckler in the audience and he's getting louder and more offensive. And Alice is trying not to pay attention to him. And people are turning around and look at him. And finally, he says something and Alice stops everything and tells him to come on up on stage. So the guy goes up on stage and they start shoving each other and Alice pulls out a switchblade and stabs the guy. And the guy falls on the, on the floor and the lights go out. And I'll tell you, people were panicking. The lights come back on and Alice is going up the steps to the judge. And the judge sentences, he's in the straight jacket. And you don't know what's going on because you didn't, it all happens in the dark. And, right. and he goes up there and he sentences him to death, right? Lights go out, come back on. And there he is up on the guillotine with the, uh, up on the, the hangman thing with the noose around his neck. Yeah. And people are, and the, and the band's giving the drum roll like that. And the <laughs> bottom falls out and he's there and he's jerking and, jerking and the lights go out. People are screaming. Women are passing out. It was like <laughs> nothing. And, it, and the lights stayed out for a while when they came back on. There was nobody on the stage. There was, <laughs> right. no, there was no encore. People hung around for like 10 minutes, hoping they could clapping and trying to get him back out. There was no encore. So then you go back to the radio, uh, turn it on, and the disc jockeys are talking about, there's a rumor that something messed up on the thing and Alice killed himself. So the best. And that's all you knew. That, there was nowhere <laughs> else to go to hear anything. And that Monday morning, I'm, you know, I'm telling Tony, I mean, do you think we should call before we go? Because, I mean, if he's dead, I mean, you know, what are we going to do? And we go there, and there he is sitting there drinking a beer, you know? I mean, it was just crazy. And we've been good friends ever since. 13 albums later, I've done 13 albums for him. Well, that's incredible. Yeah. I'd like to go back a little bit. We kind of glossed sure. over something. Like, sure. So you came from the West Coast right straight into it. And you, right. you, you did the Dolls Alive. You're not even an album cover art guy, but yet you design this thing right away, okay? So you're one for one. The next thing you do is Jesus Christ Superstar, which becomes iconic in itself. So you're two for two. And Well, before that, I got the Rolling Stones done. Oh, okay. Falls Alive, uh, then the Rolling Stones. Jesus Christ Superstar, then the Rolling Stones done. That's what I wanted to get back into is the Dolls Alive, although it's iconic in some ways for packaging, 
it led to the Rolling Stones uh, yes. song yeah. logo. So take it from there. Yeah, well, because I was showing my work and I went there to show because the headhunter called again right. and said, you know, there's a place that just does album covers. They need a creative director. They have a big project and they need a creative director. And so I reluctantly didn't want to go because I was happy where I was. It was, sure. you know, because it now where I did the Jesus Christ Superstar album, they gave me my own room and we could get high in there. The windows opened up. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, we, you could, we wait till everybody left. And they hired another guy that I got them to hire, the Sippy kid that came to work with me. And we'd get high every night. We had music. Nobody else in the studio could have music. And we were off in this room all by ourselves. And, <laughs> and it was great. So I was happy as a clam there. And But this headhunter convinced me that I should go. And by this time, <clears throat> I'm liking album covers. I'm liking, because I always like music. And I'm liking doing album covers. I did getting getting into it. Yeah, yeah. I did the Aida Opera package, beautiful package, came out great, and a whole bunch of other nothing as big as Jesus Christ Superstar. But when I went to this interview, I'm showing the Dolls Alive stuff. I'm showing the well, actually, what I did was I went there for the Jesus Christ Superstar because it was on fire. Everybody right. was talking about it. The Pope condemned it. The Catholic Church said you're <laughs> going to go to hell. It's a mortal sin. And all that shit. And so it's at the peak. And I'm at this interview. And this guy just does album covers. And what happened was his creative director got a nerve uh, uh, virus that paralyzed him from the neck down. So he couldn't do any work. I mean, he was like done. And so in, at that same time, his good friend, Marshall Chess, whose dad uh -huh. owned Chess Records and sold it to Atlantic, and his dad put him in charge of manning this, managing the Stones, came to his friend to do a logo for the band. And so, and, she, and, uh, and, and uh, Craig, the guy that we worked for, was already hooked up with Andy Warhol. He was hanging and moving in that crowd at the factory because he had did that Velvet Underground sticker. Right. So he kind of had a back door in. <clears throat> and so when Marshall came to him to do the logo, within a day or so later his creative director goes down and he's, and he's got nobody so i'm showing him the the uh, jesus christ superstar stuff and he's like yeah this is really cool uh, he goes you got anything else and i said well yeah i've got this octagon album cover that i did on board directly on board which was right in this guy's you know interest because that's where he could really make the money selling board packaging to the record companies um and and so i i said i have this and, and later, a couple of albums after Sticky Finger, they came out with the same shaped album cover because Marshall right. had seen that. They had seen it. He had showed it to them. That's right. And because Craig showed it to him and said, this is the guy that's going to be doing the, the, the logo. And so he's, he's, I showed him that and he opens up the package because uh, it opens up the flaps on the back and he's looking at the label on the record and it's a pair of lips. And he starts telling me about how he grew up with Marshall Chess and, you know, he's managing the Stones and they need a logo. And he said, if you put a, put a tongue on the outside of these lips, I think I could sell it to the Rolling Stones. So yeah. I went upstairs to his art department. He had this little three-story brownstone on 53rd between Madison and Park, across from Lever Brothers, all these skyscrapers. And there's this little three-story brownstone with a souvlaki place on the, in the basement there, you know that you walk down to and he had the top three floors. The art department was up on top. So I went up there and I did a sketch. It took about 15 minutes and I put a tongue and I put a pair of got some teeth and I went downstairs and I said, is this what you're thinking? He goes, perfect, wait here. So he goes downstairs, <laughs> he had a big bay window in his office and we could see him. He went and got in a cab. He went to Andy Warhol's factory in lower Manhattan, showed it to Marshall Chess. He was gone for about an hour and a half, two hours. And by that time, the workday was over and they brought out the pot, you know, and we're all blazing and getting high I'm with his sales guy and his head of production. <laughs> and and uh, we're, and I'm really buzzed, man. And I'm going, you know what? As much as I didn't want to work in the place that I'm working, I want to work in this place. I'll work. I'll take a, a, a decrease in salary because I'm already making more than I ever thought I was going to make anyway. <laughs> so I, I'll work there, you know, because it was all young people. It was, I, I guess the average age there, there were three sales guys, him and a beautiful secretary and a couple production people. And it was probably eight or nine people. And it was cool. I bet you the average age was 25. 
okay. you know, maybe under 30. Everybody was under 30. So it reminded me of like, this is the place. This is where I want to work. It didn't matter about Madison Avenue. Fuck Madison Avenue. Fuck straight America. I want to do this. I want to work here and I want to do album covers. And it happened. He came back and he said, okay. He said, uh, Marshall loved it. You, wow. you're gonna, you just did design the logo for the Rolling Stones. So I spent... <laughs> I did the next couple of weeks just refining it and doing the final art on it, which I have. It's all part of the collection. I have all the original. I have the original. Now, stuff. now a lot of people attribute that they get it confused because Andy Warhol did the packaging with the zipper and all that. And a lot of people mistakenly attribute that logo with the lips and tongue to Warhol. And it's not, it's you. And some right. people even perceive somehow that it was, by Milton Glaser, I have no idea why. Yeah, well, because of Push Pushpin Studios at that time, Milton Glaser, Seymour, Seymour Schwass, all those guys were, I interviewed with them. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't get the gig, but I interviewed with them. But uh, the, the, the main two guys are myself and a guy named John Boucher, yeah. who is an English designer, that if you look at my version and you look at his, they're, they're totally different. And in right. fact, I like his logo better than mine even though his came as an offshoot of mine. Uh, and that's another story. The Marshall showed the, the, my sketch to the Stones. They gave it to, to John Pache to do his version of it. And that's the one they used on the album package. They used my logo for all the merchandise, the shirts, and right. the posters, shirts yeah. and the little cloisonne pins and stuff. I did all that stuff. It took me like three or four months to do all that stuff. And, um, and so, you know, there's this, Thing about it's like a chicken and an egg you know which one came first well you know i chased the timeline i know what i did and when i went up in that art department there's all these people that they, that argue that john did it or ruby Mazer did it and uh, who, who did a logo that came much later and yeah. it was a different variation and and you know and there's all this mix up and i always tell people that it doesn't matter to me honestly i'm just so happy that I was able to be part of something that became so iconic. It's you know? amazing. Yeah, I mean, it's really that's, amazing stuff. Um, that's incredible. I incredible wanted to idea. show you a few covers and just kind of give us a brief story or some cool backstory to them all. Um, okay. We were talking about this cover, of course. Big Bamboo, yeah. But, but just something that comes to mind either in the meetings or the packaging or something interesting inside we don't know when, about. When we, just a quick little backstory is when we, I did the comp and it looked just like that. I actually made it out of board and cut it out and folded it up, and put, you know, did all the lines and all the lettering on a piece of glue to it. And I just made a, what you have there with the poster and everything. I made a, a life-size comp and I went with Tony, my partner, the sales guy to meet with Lou Adler. And we went there to his office and Cheech and Chong were there in the office. Wow. And he pulled out that album cover. You could hear, you could, I mean, they were, they were blown away. In fact, they were so blown away that the album was done. Okay. They went back into the studio and did a little snippet at the end of the album. Uh, there's a thing where Cheech goes over to Chong's house and he's got this big joint and they start smoking it. And he's got his gym socks or whatever the hell it was in there. He's saying, cause he, and, and he's talking about, well, where did you get that? And he, oh, it's in, in the new Cheech and Chong album. Later, <clears throat> cut to like maybe five years ago, I was at the Christmas pudding show that Alice does every year for charity in Arizona. And Cheech Marin was there as one of the presenters of checks from different entities to these charities and stuff. And Rob Zombie was there. There was a bunch. I was anyway, at that I, event. That was huh? a great event. Oh, yeah. Well, event. I went there when I did the box set. I did the right. back the old school box set for Alice. And we yeah. were there interviewing the band and shooting because it was the original band, except for Glenn, who had passed away. But but uh, we were able to hang out with them. And I hadn't seen them in years. And because I had started dealing with Alice, I, I did Michael Bruce's first album. But then I you just sort of get connected. And I was really always with Alice and Shep. But mm -hmm. uh, so we were, I was sitting out or standing on the, against the wall outside of Alice's dressing room. We're backstage and there's all these people and um, yeah, they were contest winners and they were family and friends and stuff. And Cheech comes out of across the hall. He comes out of his dressing room and he sees Shep and he walks over and he shakes hands with Shep 
And he looks at me and he goes, don't I know you? And I said, yeah, I'm Ernie Shuttle. He goes, you're the guy that did the, the Big Bamboo album cover, right? And I said, yeah. He said, let me tell you something, man. We sold an extra 100,000 copies because of that, co that cover that you did for us. And he said, I signed at least 25 or 30 of these a week. You know, I mean, uh, so I, I thought that was really pretty cool after all those years, you know, and then, and then after that came the All American Drug Dealing Game album that was really, really something and uh, never came out. But I, again, I, I met with Robbie, I met with Tommy, and uh, hopefully I'll be doing a cameo in their documentary talking about the Big Bamboo cover and the, uh, and, and the uh, All American Drug Dealing Game. The, 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 the only downside to all of it, and I knew it was going to happen, was when I left that company to start Pacific Ironier, because we just didn't get along with all the lies and all the bullshit that we were hearing from this guy. And yet our feet are held to the fire to, to, to deliver results. And we didn't get the support that we were. We were just like in the ocean, no life raft, nothing, just tread water. <laughs> and, you know, oh, no. and, 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 and in an environment that we didn't know anybody. You know, and so we a nasty, look, nasty corporate world. In your yeah, creative guy. well, worse than the corporate world, because yeah. and so we decided that we were going to leave that company. And when I did that, I walked away and I knew I was I knew I was walking away from any kind of credit on. And you saw I think I, you saw the letter that Shep had written yeah. to the Academy get, trying to get the credit straight because Craig and, and Tom Wilkes took all the credit for that album, when in mm -hmm. fact, they had lost the comp mysteriously somehow it got lost god only knows how that happened but yeah. they couldn't figure out tom wilkes couldn't figure out how to make it work and tom was a great designer he did the monterey job pop that's what he was the creative director at a m records did a lot of stuff did the tommy album with the big ball bearing on it yeah that was all that was all tom wilkes who i yeah. became friends with years later and we joked about everything but I knew that I was going to walk away from that, but it really hurt. I mean, it was nominated. The uh, School's Out album was nominated for a Grammy. Luckily, that same year, I was nominated for Five Dollar Shoes, which is a band that you know a lot about. And so I did that. And that that album cover uh, was nominated for Grammy the same year. So, And then we were nominated the year after that for Billion Dollar Babies. Uh, didn't win. I was always a bridesmaid, never a bride. But you know what? It doesn't matter. You know, coming in second, is is just as good as coming in first it, it, it puts you in a category where you at least had a chance to come in first and that's and those are all I mean. iconic albums we're all still listening to and yeah. looking at and there's still beautiful packaging and it, it they're yeah. iconic all those are iconic albums even yeah. five dollar shoes yeah yeah i mean they were real uh leaders uh, way ahead of everybody else yeah you know, in that music that grunge punk whatever you want to call it that different kind of music and they were real groundbreakers like simon stokes tony and you and i had talked about that that simon was never really huge but he influenced so many other people like jim dandy influenced david lee roth he ripped him off for the blonde blonde hair and the spandex pants you know i Absolutely. mean that was jim dandy man uh, you yep. know 100%. we did six albums for you. those guys had the best hash i swear to god they're, they're <laughs> amazing i went on the road with them just to trip with them we went from LA to San Diego and I played a couple of dates and I was on the bus with them and they had this whole secret stash place that they kept big blocks of hash, man. And they just smoked <laughs> hash and, and chewed tobacco. The whole, they all had coffee cans that they'd spit into. That was a very strange band and just great guys. And Butch Stone was managing them at the time. Yeah. That was, you know, that was a rock classic rock. period in time, no doubt. Yes. Um, yes. Kind of related to them is this cover. Um, oh, I know that cover. So yeah. uh, Grand, Grand Funk. Funk Railroad. That's another so, one that I didn't get credit for. E but, uh, Funk. Um, People don't realize how big Grand Funk was today. Oh, they were huge. They were huge. Yeah. In fact, when we, when Bonnie and I first went to New York, so I got the job. She came. She was there for like a few weeks, and we decided that we were going to go to see Grand Funk Railroad. They were at uh, Fillmore East, and they, uh, 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 what is it? Uh, Pacific Gas and Electric opened for mm -hmm. them, and there was a couple other minor bands, and we dropped some acid. I had brought some acid with me from, from Oakland when I was in college. <laughs> we had great acid and mushrooms and pot. I brought a couple pounds of pot, smuggled it all there to New York. And so we dropped some acid and went to the concert, man. It was amazing. And Mark Farner 
Grand Funk Railroad for me was one of my favorite bands. I liked them even more than the Stones. I'm Your Captain wow. was like on acid that even when you're straight, that song is amazing. Mark Farner was amazing. And again, another thing like the Jefferson Airplane story, I'm, you know, a big fan of theirs. And the next thing you know, I'm in Troy, Michigan, hanging out with them on Mark's ranch. We almost burned down his guest house, shooting that shot that's on the inside of uh, the Phoenix album. Oh, yeah. We almost burned down the photographer's house, <laughs> shooting the front cover, because we built this fire, and it was under his steps. It had a two-story place, and it was under his steps, and we built this fire, and we, we did this Phoenix, and we had it suspended on wires, and this big gas trough underneath it. The flames went up and caught the porch on fire. Oh, man, it was crazy. But we got the shot. And it, we duplicated a similar situation in Troy, Michigan, in a hotel room where we rented and started a fire in there and got that shot of them that's on the end. On the back <laughs> but they almost burned the whole place down. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and so we got a chance to spend a couple of days with him and Don. And, you know, it was great at Mark's Ranch. And great guys. Was that a weed, and, was, was that a weed band? Yeah, it was. Yeah, I think so. I mean, for me, it was, <laughs> yeah. you know, it was, you know, I mean, they, they were actually, I think Mark Farner was pretty straight, but I don't know. Right. You know, Don, Don, I know got high because he was dating our secretary. When we started Pacific Guy in here, he was dating and, and he was married. And he was dating her and it, it was crazy, but we got a chance to be with a lot of those bands. And that was for me again, like the Jefferson airplane, big fan, make sure you know, I'm getting high with him. You know, same thing with, you know, with Grand Funk Railroad. I'm there at their house with them and, you know, just this amazing thing. And that album cover, when I designed it, there was only one other round album cover. And it was done by Little Faces, I think, or well, somebody yeah. like that. It was an English band. And, Ogden's, um, Ogden's Not Gone Flake. That, is that, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tobacco exactly. package. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, but that album, uh, I had to do line drawings I had to get, they sent me photographs of them from the profile and I had to do black and white line drawings of them. And then I spent two weeks every day, except weekends in New Jersey, going from Brooklyn to New Jersey with a little old uh, plate etcher that had dentist tools. And we would plant, we would, he would carve into the aluminum plates these images, these line art images, and he had a small one-off press that he would press the album out of foil to make sure that it wasn't too deep and would crack it. So wow. it was like this amazing, it was like watching like a jeweler dentist. or something. It's like a huh? jeweler. It's yeah, like a jeweler. exactly. He was like a jeweler and the plates were, you know, 12 and 3 eighths by 12 and 3 eighths. And then he did two sets of those and then they went to the printer and they, you know, they died, they, uh, embossed and debossed that cover and again every little nuance every little shape to define them could either be too deep or not deep enough so it was finding that happy medium between debossing and embossing to make that right and i spent two weeks with him you know every day for like eight hours a day man it was crazy but that now, was, now, you know, now that was later later copied some years later not the round shape but by kiss double platinum yeah. They had a, a gatefold that opened and it had the Kiss guys and nobody knew what they looked like without makeup. So right. people would do like a rub off and, you know, try to see and what see they it. look like. Right. Because of right. the texture of their face. Right. Yeah. I remember that. The, and they, they obviously like Grand Funk. I mean, everybody did that. Yeah. I, again, I mean, I thought they were great. I mean, and seeing them live uh, at the Fillmore was just a real, you know, I mean, we went to the Bangladesh concert as well in, in New York. Didn't oh, yeah. do much of that because I was always busy working. You know, I worked, even when I was working at places, even at Craig Bruns, I was freelancing. I had this friend named Nick Scalise and he worked at Scholastic Books. They were in New York and those are the books oh, yeah. you got when you were in school. Well, yeah. he was the creative director there and I had gone there for a job interview and we hit it off really well. And at lunchtime, we went out and burned a fatty and, you know, we became really good friends and he would give me freelance work. I designed a lot of covers for the book, the magazine books that would go to the schools. Yeah. Steven, well, do you happen to, Steven, do you have a, a black, happen to have a Black Sabbath album cover there? Yeah, there were two covers I wanted to do. So let's go. I wanted to ask you about this. 